Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is an interesting one with an interesting title, Managing for the Master Till He Comes. This is lesson number seven in that series for February 18 of 2023, entitled, Unto the Least of These. See if you can guess what that's about. As usual, we'd like to begin with the word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we bow our heads once again, recognizing your presence with us. We do so much need your guidance and direction when we study these lessons and we try to understand the scriptures better. Send us the guidance we need with the Holy Spirit as we study together with our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. In numerous places throughout the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, God speaks of dealing with the fatherless, the widows, the aliens, or strangers. These people are sometimes referred to as the least of these my brethren. That's when Jesus, at least one time very specifically, Jesus used that term, which we're all quite familiar with. In Matthew 25, verse 40, Jim, what does it say? The king will reply, I tell you, whenever you do this, for one of the least important of these members of my family, you did it for me, from the American Bible Society. From the Bible Study Guide, how can we identify these people today? The strangers of Bible times were individuals who had to leave their homeland, perhaps because of war or famine. The equivalent in our day would be the millions of refugees who have become destitute because of circumstances they did not choose. The fatherless are children who have lost fathers through war, accident, or sickness. This group, who, me, this group also could include those whose fathers are in prison or are otherwise absent. What a broad field of service is exposed here from the Bible Study Guide for February yeah. 11. So, does this apply to all single-parent households in our day? Does this apply to women with children who have never been married? Dwayne? The widows are those who, for the same reasons as the fatherless, have lost their spouses. Many are, are the head of a single-parent family and could use the help that the church can provide. As we will see this week, because we are managers of God's business, helping the poor is not just an option. It is following the example of Jesus and obeying his commands. Also from the uh, Bible study guide. You know, I will just make a comment. This is maybe my personal bias, but I think it's straight from scripture. I think of all the government help programs and so forth, if we were really doing what Jesus wanted, all those things would be out of the government's hands. They would be in, in the hands of the local church. We would be able to deal with people on a local, person-to-person -person basis, and we would be way ahead of where we are now. Well, if there were any group of people who were familiar with Jesus, it should have been the people of Nazareth. After Jesus left them and engaged in his ministry, they had heard rumors of his teachings and his miracles. When he came home, uh, the rabbi in charge of the service asked him to read the passage from Scripture for the day. It was not the first time Jesus had been asked to do this, and many people are not familiar with this expression, this paragraph from Desire of Ages, but it's a very significant one, I think. The atmosphere of hope and courage that surrounded him, that is Jesus, made him a blessing in every home. And this, uh, this is talking about Jesus' childhood. And often in the synagogue on the Sabbath day, he was called upon to read the lesson from the prophets and the hearts of the hearers thrilled as a new light shone out from the familiar words of the sacred text. You know, this, that's, that's an important passage. Yeah. Because if indeed that's the case, what were those religious leaders peddling? Yeah. They're not a whole lot different probably than what we're exposed to and everybody else exposed to around yeah. the world. And Jesus, today. yeah, Jesus as a child could read the text and present it in a way just very simply uh, that would just thrill people's hearts. Well, Jesus read on this particular occasion as he went back to Nazareth from the word, read the words of Isaiah in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2 with one very significant exemption. You want to read that? The Sovereign Lord has filled me with His Spirit. 
He has chosen me and sent me to bring good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to announce release to captives, and freedom to those in prison. He has sent me to proclaim that the time has come when the Lord will save his people and defeat their enemies. Okay. Now, maybe, I, I think it would be able to say he will heal his people. Yeah. What, which of those lines do you think the Jews like to read most of all? <laughs> Probably the last two. The last one. Defeat their enemies. However, Jesus did not read that last line. If you look at the way he quoted it in Luke 4, the last line is not there. And this was the portion of the passage that the people loved to read. And it was part of the reason why they believed that when the Messiah would come, he would lead them, he, I'm sorry, he would help them to defeat their enemies. So this is what led them to think this was a messianic passage. So why do you think Jesus did not read that last sentence? That is not in favor of war. <laughs> he wasn't in One, favor of for war. Starters. Yeah, exactly. That wasn't his main reason for coming. That's right. Well, what happens if you look at the rest of, look back up there again at, the, at that passage. Look at all the other things he was supposed to do. Bring good news to the poor, heal the brokenhearted, announce the release to captives, freedom, though, freedom to those in prison, set to proclaim the good news that time has come and the Lord will save his people. Well, that's not the kind of stuff they want to know. They want to repeat their enemies, right? Okay. Well, Dwayne? Because the religious leaders apparently had overlooked the prophecies that spoke of a suffering Messiah and had misapplied those that pointed to the glory of his second coming, which should serve as a reminder to us of how important understanding prophecy really is, most of the people believed the false idea that the Messiah's mission was to free Israel from its conquerors and oppressors, the Romans. To think that the Messiah's mission statement came from Isaiah 61, 1 and 2 must have been a real shock when read without the last phrase. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, you know, they, they, I could just see, oh, you know, they're getting all excited. Oh, yeah, yeah. You didn't read the last sentence. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure they knew it well enough. Oh, yes. No, they what knew it by memory. Next. And huh? it never came. Yeah. And that, it's not there. What? The, go ahead. There's the next the, part. The poor there. usually were looked down upon by unscrupulous officials, such as tax collectors, those in business, and even their own neighbors. It commonly was thought that poverty was the curse of God and that their unfortunate condition must have been their own fault. With this mindset, few people had any concern for the poor and their unhappy plight. Also from the Bible study guide. Yeah. Even the John the Baptist found it hard to believe that Jesus Christ was the coming Messiah when he was not making any move to lead the Israelites against the Romans. Matthew 11, 1 to 6. When Jesus finished giving these instructions to his 12 disciples, he left that place and went off to teach and preach in the towns near there. When John the Baptist heard in, in prison, remember he's in, in uh, Machara, Machaerus, um, about the things that Christ was doing, he sent some of his disciples to him. Tell us, they asked Jesus, are you the one John said was going to come or should we expect someone else? Jesus answered, go back and tell John what you are hearing and seeing. The blind can see, the lame can walk, those who suffer from, the dreaded, from dreaded skin disease are made clean. That's, of course, what well, tradition has been called the leprosy. The deaf hear, the dead are brought back to life, and the good news is preached to the poor. How happy are those who have no doubts about me? I mean, if you can do all those kinds of things, look at everything you did there. You know, and they, and they went back to John the Baptist, and they told him about what they had seen there. They had been watching Jesus for a whole day. What do you think he said? That's the guy. That's, he's the right one. So there was nobody else that might have been? Nobody else that was able to do those kinds of things. Nobody. And then Ellen White's comment, like the Savior's disciples, John the Baptist did not understand the nature of Christ's kingdom. He expected Jesus to take the throne of David, and as time passed and the Savior made no claim to kingly authority, John became perplexed and troubled. I mean, Jesus himself said that John was the greatest of the, of the prophets. 
Now he, he, he completely misunderstood Christ's mission. We're not still waiting for the, for the Israelites to rise up and conquer the Romans. What should be the essence of our Christianity and our goal for our time in this earth today? Jim? James 1.27 what God the Father considers to be pure and genuine religion is this, to take care of orphans and widows in their suffering and to keep oneself from being corrupted by the world, from the Good News Bible. Okay, I have a question for you. What if one Sabbath the pastors and all the churches around here got up and said, we'll have a regular service this week, but next week, Instead of having a Sabbath morning service, we're going to go out and we're going to take care of orphans and widows and their suffering and keep themselves unspotted or uncorrupted from the world. Everybody's going to scan out. We're going to cover the place. Well, what happened? Well, you could probably show up with a couple of vans and have some room left over. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's, my, that's, my, that's my fear. Yeah. So does this mean we don't understand pure religion? It says there, pure and genuine religion is this. Isn't that what it says? Are we taking these things seriously? Well, if you remember, was it Ezekiel 16? Oh, yeah. Uh, but about, they're talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. The reason that what happened to them is because they weren't taking care of the widows and the orphans. Among other things. It wasn't their sex, sexual proclivities yeah. that were mentioned. It was talking yeah. about they weren't taking care of the widows and the orphans. In the days of the ancient Israelites, God had made some very interesting and challenging provisions for orphans, widows, and the strangers, sometimes called aliens. Exodus 23, 10 and 11 and 22. For six years, sow your field and gather in what it produces. But in the seventh year, let it rest, and do not harvest anything that grows on it. The poor meet what grows there, and the wild animals can have what is left. Do the same with your vineyards and your olive trees. But if you obey him and do everything I command, this is 22 now, I will fight against all your enemies. What would you think of having every seventh year off? You don't have to work. God will take care of you to fight against your enemies. Sound like a good idea? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's, that was God's don't, plan. Don't just smile at me. That was God's plan. Yeah. yeah. That's... Well, many of us today live in places where the government, even charitable organizations, have programs to support widows, orphans, the elderly, and the poor. Does that mean that if we give some money to, we pay our taxes to the government, and we give money to some charitable organizations, we've fulfilled our duties? And how should the church's responsibilities relate to these programs? Now the church has, we, we administer have huge programs to help people in, you know, I've been, I spent 17 years working in East Africa. And I know the church has done great things for times when they were in famine and so forth uh, over there. So, okay, well, Dwayne, you want to read what else it says in Psalms 82? Psalm 82, 3 and 4 tells us, Defend the rights of the poor and the orphans. Be fair to the needy and the helpless. Rescue them from the power of the wicked. From the Good News Bible. Then there are promises to those who help the needy. He who gives to the poor will not lack. From Proverbs 28, 27. The king who judges the poor with truth, his throne will be established forever. From Proverbs 29, 14. And King David noted, Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in the time of trouble. From Psalm 41.1. This, then, always had been a priority in ancient Israel, even if at times the people lost sight of it. So that was what God's plan was. I mean, there, it, it's pretty clear. There's not too much arguing with that. So do these promises apply to us in the 21st century? That's the real question. I mean, it, th those are pretty impressive promises. So if, if we're taking care of the poor and the widows and the orphans, well, God will take care of us? I, I, 
I just think if, if that's if that was God's plan for His people back then, or, or if we're His people today, then that's probably the plan we should be following. Okay. Um, there's an interesting, I haven't heard this for quite a long time, they used to say that the Seventh-day Adventist Church was like a chimney. Have you ever heard that before? No. Jim, have you ever heard that expression? Yeah, I think I have. We take people in at, at the very lowest levels of poor people, the widows, the orphans, I was like this. We educate them, we train them, we raise them culturally and so forth, and then they leave through the through the top, going out to do their... <laughs> Good metaphor. And it, it happens sometimes like that. So is that what the church is supposed to be doing? Well, we're helping the poor and the widows and the orphans. What's interesting, what, what message do they get when they come over from some of those lands? Do they, and they come over here and then do they go back with... with, with, with yeah. a, 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 so I mean, that gives you some indication of what, uh, what they're learning over here or... or <laughs> yeah. What, uh, well... Well, there's not a lot of incentive to go back to countries where you're oppressed and persecuted. Yeah. Well, here's a challenge. In contrast, even in more modern times, particularly in England, under the impact of what has been known as social Darwinism, Many thought that not only was there no moral imperative to help the poor, but also that it was, in fact, wrong to do so. Instead, following the forces of nature, I mean, you know, social Darwinism, what happens in Darwinism? The strong beat up on the weak, right? Which the strong survive at the expense of the weak. Social Darwinists believe that it would be detrimental to society to help the poor, the sickly, and the indigent because if they multiplied, they would only weaken the social fabric of the nation as a whole. However cruel, this thinking was the logical outgrowth of belief in evolution and the fa false narrative it proclaims. So, how should the gospel, the idea that Christ died for everyone, impact how we treat everyone? regardless of who they are, and that's from our Bible study guide from Monday. So how do we relate to social Darwinists? Well, when you have the rich of the world, they refer to the masses as useless eaters. That ought to be a yeah. clue as to really what the direction is of the world. They have, and then you bring people over, you know, here, America, we've had some level of respect for human life. You bring in people over from some of these countries that have an awful lot of people, they, they just maybe almost like they die like flies. They don't have a, all that much care for uh, the welfare yeah. and respect for... And then you have the, these, those here, here to control. You, can, they, you deceive them. You get, give them uh, false information. And uh, we could go on. Yeah. Well... So how did Jesus relate to the rich in his day? We've talked about the poor now for a little bit. How did Jesus relate to the rich in his day? Let's look at some examples. Duane? Once a man came to Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what good thing must I do to receive eternal life? Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all you have and give the money to the poor, and you will have riches in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he was very rich. And that story is repeated in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. Um, can you imagine what it would have been like if he had really done that? Gone out, took, give money to the poor, helped all kinds of people, and says, okay, he comes back and he's just like an ordinary person and joins the disciples. How would they have responded? Oh, we have a speculation. <laughs> we don't, we don't, yeah, we've never had that experience. So why do you think Jesus told the rich young ruler to sell everything and give to the poor? Should this command be implemented today? Well, we know this young man made a terrible decision. He instead of being willing to give up his idol, riches, he chose to keep them and rejected the chance to be a disciple of Jesus and receive eternal life. 
What a terrible trade-off. Jesus, and from our Bible study guide we read, Jesus doesn't ask most of us to sell all we have and give the money to the poor, but money must have been this young man's God. And though Jesus' answer may seem quite severe, he knew that, that doing this was this man's only hope of salvation. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Mark 8, 35 to 37. What does it mean to lose your life for the sake of the gospel? It's from our Bible study guide. There's a lot lose of your life. That. What? There's a lot of people that have done that. Yeah. Now, I have They're a, all I have the disciples. Yeah. Except for John. John, maybe. Yes. I, I have a question about that. Um, uh -huh. You, you can lose your, your life, uh, have, it, have it taken, but what if, it, does it apply if you put aside your, your natural inclinations and uh, desire for a career or something? Well, for example, I was thinking about the, uh, the gentleman in England that you actually mentioned in, in uh, Sabbath school last, last mm -hmm. week that fed, I think, orphans over there for decades. Yeah. And, you know, it, that may not have been his initial life's ambition. No. But... Became he, world famous. But he left that aside and <laughs> chose a different path. By contrast with the story of the rich young ruler we just spoke about, think about the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a despised tax collector who was hated because he collected taxes on behalf of Herod and the Roman government. Often such tax collectors collected more than they were allowed to by law and pocketed the extra money for themselves. Read the story of Zacchaeus in Luke 19, 1 to 10. Jesus, Luke, uh, Luke 19, 1 to 10. Jesus went in, on into Jericho now this is very interesting because Jesus is on his last journey up to up to Jerusalem. I, I b believe this is on. His, I'm pretty sure this is yeah, Luke 19. Yes, it was. And his disciples. There was a huge crowd with him, and they were they. You know the the people who live in Galilee. In order to get down to Jerusalem, they had to cross the Jordan River. They, they went down along the the eastern side of the Jordan River because. Um, they didn't, so they wouldn't have to walk through Samaritan territory because they were enemies of the Samaritans. Get down to the bottom, cross the river again to Jericho, and then travel up the, the steep hill up to Jerusalem. So Zacchaeus, his place, and that, that, was, that was the main road from, from um, Mesopotamia to Egypt. It was the one main place for people who wanted to, for that, those were the two big powers in the world in those days. So it was a major thoroughfare. So the tax sectors in that area did well because they, they collected taxes on all the tra you know, stuff traveling through. Well, so here's Zacchaeus, and we, he's known about Jesus, and he, he says, I, I have to see this Jesus. There was a chief tax collector there named Zacchaeus who was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but he was a little man and could not see Jesus because of the crowd. So he ran ahead of the crowd, climbed a sycamore tree to see Jesus, who was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to Zacchaeus, hurry down, Zacchaeus, because I must stay in your house today. <laughs> you can imagine the crowd around, because they believed that they were escorting Jesus to Jerusalem to crown him king. They absolutely were certain that they were gonna take Jesus up to Jerusalem. When they got there, they were gonna crown him king. So, and here's this person that they think they're just about to crown as king, and he's asking to go and stay with a tax collector. What, I'm trying to imagine the crowd at that point in time, you know. I'm sure they were talking, and they were three, and they were all excited about it. And all this. What? Did he say he was going to Zacchaeus' house? Well... Zacchaeus hurried down and welcomed him with great joy. All the people who saw it started grumbling. This man has gone as a guest of the home of a sinner. 
Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Listen, sir, I will give half of my belongings to the poor, and if I have cheated anyone, I will pay back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Salvation has come to this house today, for this man also is a descendant of Abraham. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, how similar were the experiences of the rich young ruler and Zacchaeus? We just read the two stories. What, was the, what, was, what were the similarities between the two? They both had wealth. Yeah, they were possible. both wealthy. They both wanted to see Jesus because they felt that he had something that they needed. Jesus told the rich young man to sell everything. However, he was satisfied when Zacchaeus said he was willing to give half. Why this difference? Jim? Ellen White said, when the rich young ruler had turned away from Jesus, the disciples had marveled at their master saying, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? They had exclaimed to one another, who then can be saved? Now they will, excuse me, now they had a demonstration of the truth of Christ's words. The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Mark 10, 24 and 26, Luke 18, 27. They saw how through the grace of God, a rich man could enter into the kingdom. From Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 555. Now remember in those days, the idea was, if you were a good person, what would happen? God will bless you, and when God blesses you, what happens? Jim, you're an expert on this. Well, that's the oldest philosophy that I can <laughs> we, we, we start. If the oldest book in the Bible is the book of Job, yeah. and that's their philosophy, and if bad things are happening to you, God's not smiling on you. and you. If God smiles on you, you get rich, right? That's the way they interpret it. So Zacchaeus was blessed. Is, is, yeah. is, is that how they saw it? But, but well, yeah. except that he was a tax collector. This is the problem. Is he a good man or is he a bad man? And now Jesus is going to his house, to stay at his house. Incongruity that they couldn't <laughs> wrestle with. <laughs> they didn't know, what are you doing with this? This is a craziness going on here. Consider the story of Job. <clears throat> Jim, you just mentioned Job. A man who was very wealthy and lived long before the rich young, young ruler in Zacchaeus. Notice the words of God about Job. Dwayne? Uh, Job 1.8. Did you notice my servant Job? The Lord asked. There is no one on earth as faithful and good as he is. He worships me and is careful not to do anything evil. And who was God speaking to when he made that, said those words? Satan. Satan. He was adversary. speaking to the devil himself. Imagine God saying those words to the devil. Now we know if you have take time, if you got time and you haven't, don't know this yourself already, jump over to chapter four of Job and read verses twelve to twenty-nine, and in there you'll see that one of Job's friends they thought they were coming to to give the truth to Job. One of those friends had a vision in the night and he saw some kind of a creature. And, and what did the creature say to him? You remember what it said over there? God doesn't trust us. God doesn't. Yeah. Doesn't trust anybody. He won't, he won't bless anybody. Elfaz. What are you talking about? That was so, Elfaz. Yeah, he was, he was directly contradicting God's words. Directly contradicting. And I remember what a surprise. about 25 years or more ago when uh, your wife yeah. addressed that issue in Sabbath school. This was a, this is a, his, his words, of, the words of the devil over in, in verse, in Job 4, and it, was a memory verse. And it took me about 30 years to, or 25, 30 years to finally, uh, uh, the question was, what were the lies that were told by the friends of Job? Yeah. And I went through, and the lies, I using a, a program called ESORD, draw those out, and the lies are that God punishes and God destroys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and that God doesn't know how to judge human character. Well, you know, there's people that, that uh, the, what's it, uh, process theologians, mm -hmm. like Claremont and so forth, a lot of people right here at the university. Uh, God is kind of learning on the job. 
Mm -hmm. uh, he, he can't, it doesn't know the future, you know, because if you knew the future, then you're, you're not free. So I, I understand where they're coming from, but they aren't playing with a full deck. Yeah. Because Job is a good example in Job 1 and 2, where God says, when, when the, the serpent or Satan says, uh, he'll curse you to your face. God says, no, he's a righteous and upright man. Well, that's foreknowledge. Mm -hmm. That's not guessing on the part of no. the infinite one. No. Don't you wish that God could say those words about you? And incredibly, despite the disasters that came upon Job, he remained faithful to God. The devil was sure that he had caused Job to give up his faith and turn against God. But God essentially said, no, Job is faithful and good, perfect and upright. And who proved to be correct? God. What kind of a person was Job before all the disasters hit him? Well, this is his report. Um, Dwayne? When the poor cried out, I This is in Job 29. Now Job is giving his final response to his enemies. Go ahead. Yes. When the poor cried out, I helped them. I gave help to the orphans who had nowhere to turn. Those who were in deepest misery praised me, and I helped widows find security. I have always acted justly and fairly. I was eyes for the blind and feet for the lame. I was like a father to the poor and took the side of strangers in trouble. Wow. Notice that these very, notice these very interesting words that Job spoke. He went to the extra effort to take the side of strangers in trouble and even search them out in order to help them. Should we be doing that in our day? Ellen White comments, do not wait for them, that is the poor, to call your attention to their needs. Act as did Job. The thing he knew not, he searched out. Go on an inspecting tour and learn what is needed and how it can be best supplied. What would happen if we spent a Sabbath going through the community looking for the people who are, who are in, in, in the biggest distress and help them. You know, the, the one, of, one of the things I, I, I see in Job is he was more interested, it seems, in his friendship with God and, yeah. and being able to talk with him than he was in his own distress. Mm -hmm. he, just, he just wanted to talk to God to understand why. Okay, there's another passage that gives us instructions about what we're supposed to be, how we're, what kind of stuff we're supposed to, how we're supposed to behave. Jim? Isaiah 58, chapter 58, verses 6 to 8. The kind of fasting I want is this. Remove the chains of oppression and the yoke of injustice and let the oppressed go free. Share your food with the hungry and open your homes to the homeless poor. Give clothes to those who have nothing to wear and do not refuse to help your own relatives. Then my favor will shine on you like the morning sun, and your wounds will be quickly healed. I will always be with you to save you. My presence will protect you on every side. You the good news Bible. And Ellen White says, after quoting Matthew 25, verses 31 to 33. That's where it talks about separating the sheep from the goats. Thus Christ on the Mount of Olives pictured to his disciples the scene of the great judgment day, and he represented the decision as turning upon one point. When the nations are gathered before him, there will be but two classes, and their eternal, excuse me, and their eternal destiny will be determined by what they have done or have neglected to do for him in the person of the poor and the suffering. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 637. Ellen White also said, as you open your door to Christ's needy and suffering ones, you are welcoming unseen angels. You invite the companionship of heavenly beings. They bring a sacred atmosphere of joy and peace. They come with praises upon their lips, and an answering strain is heard in heaven. Every deed of mercy makes music there. The Father from his throne numbers the unselfish workers among his most precious treasures. Desire of Ages 639. We know about the statement both in the Old Testament and the New Testament that poverty will never cease any time short of the second com coming. So how should we respond? Is this a good excuse for us not to, quote, take on, end quote, the situation of the poor? Well, here's what 
Paul says under the inspiration of Scripture. Dwayne? 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Let's speak about the story of Paul for just a moment. When he was very young, he was already a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a Pharisee. Do you think he was rich? Okay. Absolutely he was rich. A young person who was admitted to the Sanhedrin wouldn't get there unless he was rich. And now look what he's saying. He's left all that. He's traveling on foot. He's helping to support him. the people who are working with him. Incredible. How do you think things would be in our world today if everyone had followed God's original directions for dealing with the poor as given in, in those Old Testament passages? Deuteronomy 15, verses 4 and 5 and 11. The Lord your God will bless you in the land that he is giving you. Not one of your people will be poor if you obey him and carefully observe everything that I command you today. There will always be some Israelites who are poor and in need, and so I command you to be generous to them. Now, it's specifically talking about Israelites. Does that mean that our first attention should go to church members? Well, Matthew 26, 11, Jesus himself said, uh, you will always have poor people with you, but you will not always have me. Is he talking about his disciples, other Jews at that point in time? Or was he talking about the Gentiles? I think he was talking about the Gentile. I mean, he was talking about other the Jews, wasn't he? God's original plan for the poor included not just a collective societal responsibility, but also individual responsibility for the poor. First of all, people were to be responsible to their own relatives. That's number one. Special provisions were made at the end of every seven-year period, and then even more so at the end of the 50-year cycle for all land and property to be returned to its original owners. You remember the, the time of the Jubilee. And you know that uh, there's talk now in our government uh, we should have a Jubilee. Cancel all the debts. And of course it means that all the people who have loaned their money to banks and to other people are going to lose it. Well, when Jesus spoke of these, of the least of these, Matthew 25, 35 to 40, who was, who was included? Jim, I think the that's Bible yours. Bible study guide. All those who suffer from the Bible, excuse me, from Bible references, it is possible to identify classes of suffering individual, individuals who need protection. Using a basic grouping concept, the poor are, A, those who were incapable of providing for their material need and thus were unable to live a dignified life against, excuse me, because of social rejection or prejudice, that is, prisoners, lepers, and foreigners, for example. Number B, those who suffered extreme economic deprivation against the, excuse me, because of adverse conditions, the poor, that is, the diseased, hungry, thirsty, naked, needy, and wretched. Number C, those with physical constraints, for example, the mute, the blind, and lame. Number D, those who were emotionally discouraged and perhaps psychologically unable to care for themselves without assistance, that is, the broken, hearted, the mentally ill, and the perishing. Number E, victims of their own mistakes, oppression, and injustice. For example, the outcasts, exiles, prisoners, vic victims of inequality, brutality, and exploitation, and, number F, those who need help to start their lives anew. Read Leviticus 23:22, Deuteronomy 15:11, Luke 4:18 and 19, Isaiah 62:1 and 2, Job 29:12 to 16, Matthew 11, Ju Luke 2. 20 to 22 and Matthew Luke 7, 20, Matthew 20. 7, excuse me, Luke 7, 20 
to 20 to 22, Matthew 25, 35 to 40. This is from the Bible Study Guide. Yeah. Okay, now let's be honest and talk a little bit about our situation. Often when we look at those who are impoverished in our day, the first question that comes to our minds is, what happened to them and why are they in this condition? Duane, you want to answer that? I'll read someone's answer. <laughs> the circumstances of poverty and the question of whether the sufferer is responsible for his or her impoverished state are irrelevant. Neither is the question of whether such a person deserves to receive assistance or not. Even a person from a rival nation should be the object of God's love in practicing charity, as we see demonstrated in the parable of the Samaritan. Okay, so who was it in that, that journey from Jericho up to Jerusalem who helped the person who had been beaten up and robbed? The Samaritan. Samaritan. The Samaritan, and who passed by? A Pharisee. A priest and a Levite. And Ellen White goes on to say that the one who had been robbed was a Levite. Believe that, believe it or not. Yeah, but if you got, if you, I mean, it, it shouldn't you, matter. We should, you should help them no matter what. Yeah, but see, the the point of view that they they had was that if bad things are happening, is because you deserve it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, so uh, how do you counter that yeah. one? Well, really? well, yeah, and then if if that's the way the world works, should you intervene in God's will? Well, there is, and you take the Calvinists. Why do you? Buy, have, 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 have a message for the for the world. God already knows who's going to get to get the goodies. That's, that's pure mm -hmm. Calvinism, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Did I, I mess, mess that up? Well, a Samaritan took care of this guy, took him to an inn, paid for his care, left some money to keep, if he had to stay a little while longer and so forth. And when Jesus told that story in Jerusalem, it was known, in fact, the Levite and the priest who were involved in that story were in the crowd, in the courtyard of the temple, when Jesus told the story. <laughs> you, you, this, so this was not just... This is not a story made up. This, was a, or a, this was a real story. Oh, Absol I wasn't aware of that. Yes. Ellen White makes that very, very clear. Yeah. Well, Luke 10, 27 to... 37. The man answered, love, uh, uh, certainly the best response to this question is the story of the Good Samaritan we've just been talking about. And Luke 10 we read, the man answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. So this is someone who comes up to Jesus and says, okay, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus says, well, what, what do you think? And the guy says, he, he gives the two great commandments. And you're right, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But the teacher of the law who wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? So why did he ask that question? He wasn't just all of a sudden thinking about neighbors. Do you know why he, why he asked that question? That was one of the huge questions they argue about. Should a Pharisee help a Sadducee? Should a Sadducee help a Pharisee? Should either one of them help anybody who belonged to, I mean, you would never stop and help a tax collector. None of those, none of those people at the bottom of the social ladder. No, nah, we don't, we we don't even touch those people. We are Pharisees. We are Sadducees. They they argued at no uh, to no length, no end of length, about who is my neighbor. So, what Jesus puts this question back on him, and of course, what what comes to his mind first of all, he knows that you can argue forever about who is my neighbor. So, he says, puts the question to Jesus, who is my neighbor. Of course, you know what happened. Jesus answered, there was once a man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And the man is standing right over there. And he didn't say that. <laughs> but he knew it. When robbers attacked him, stripped him, and beat him, leaving him half dead, it so happened that a priest was going down that road. But when he saw the man, he walked by, on by on the other side. Yeah, he's that guy over there. In the same way, a Levite also came along, went over and looked at the man, and then walked on, walked on by on the other side. Yeah, that guy over there. But a Samaritan who was traveling that way came upon the man, and when he saw him, his heart was filled with pity. 
He went over to him, poured oil and wine on his wounds and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own animal and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins. How much is a silver coin worth? This was a working man's daily wage. So this is two days wages. This guy gave him. Gave them to the innkeeper. Take care of him, he told the innkeeper. And when I come back this way, I will pay you whatever else you spend on him. So not just two days wages, could be a lot more. And Jesus concluded, in your opinion, which one of these three actors like, acted like a neighbor towards the man attacked by the robbers? And the teacher of the law couldn't even bring himself to say the name Samaritan. He just said, the one who was kind to him. Jesus replied, you go then and do the same. <laughs> you know, in light of that, the whole crowd that were no doubt standing around listening to this, I mean, they looked at this guy, what do you think they had? It's like he asked him to embrace a leper. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Is that what, what this? yeah, a little bit like that. Wow. Sell all you have and give it to the poor. Yeah. yeah. Well, Christ referred to himself as the Son of God and our brother and kinsman redeemer. How are we to interpret those words and apply his teachings? Well, the story of the Good Samaritan tells us that every person in need is our brother and how we, how we should relate to him or her is not linked to ties of blood, religion, or nationality. Our love should extend to the entire human race. God sent his son to, to this world to save everyone without discrimination of any kind. How do we know that? What did Jesus himself say to John the Baptist? I'm sorry, let me make this a little bit larger so it's easier to read. For God loved the world. This is, of course, a familiar verse. We could quote it from the King James. But my good news Bible says, For God loved the world so much. Who's included in the world? Everyone. He loved them so much that he gave his only son that everyone who believes in him may not die, but have eternal life. Okay? How are we to implement charitable goals? Charity should motivate and enable a person to learn how to improve his or, own, his or her own situation and not to continue to depend upon charity. I'm sure you all remember the story about the man who was begging and the fisherman came along and he says, I could give you a fish, but let me teach you how to fish. And then you can take care of yourself. Okay, Jim, Proverbs 25 and so forth. Verses 21 and 22. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them a drink. You will make them burn with shame and the Lord will be your reward. Good News Bible. Romans 12 verses 20 and 21. Instead, as the scripture says, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them a drink. For by doing so, you will make them burn with shame. Guess where he got that? Mm. <laughs> Just quoting Proverbs, isn't he? Mm. Go ahead. Do not tell, excuse me, do not let evil defeat you. Instead, conquer your evil with good. Good News Bible. So those who suffer persecution because of their faith are God's special ones. We should help them as far as we are able. Now, some of us um, know about groups. There are Adventist groups that are taking upon themselves a special challenge of reaching out to people who are, you know, in, in, in very in desperate situations. We are already trying to we're trying to do a bunch of work for the people in Yugoslavia in, in Ukraine right now. Um, is that one of the things we should be doing? Certainly, certainly, it seems like that would be the right thing to do, doesn't it? Those who suffer persecution because of their faith are God's special ones. We should help them as far as we are able. Matthew 5, 10 to 12. Dwayne? Happy are those who are persecuted because they do what God requires. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Happy are you when people insult you and persecute you and tell all kinds of evil lies against you because you are my followers. Be happy and glad, for a great reward is kept for you in heaven. 
This is how the prophets who lived before you were persecuted. And you wonder who they thought about when he said that. In our day, does charity encourage begging and parasitic dependency? What is the best way to employ charity to improve people's efforts at recovery? Charity is to become rehabilitative. We've already read Isaiah 58, 68. We've also read Luke 4, 16 to 19, the story of Jesus and his, when he went back to Nazareth. So apart from whatever efforts a church might undertake, what is our individual responsibility for helping the poor? Our Bible study guide says, one, we should feel the desire to participate. Church members may adopt a personal support plan to assist someone in need. They also may, help, may work together to volunteer an educational project run by the church to help the needy with life skills and personal development. So that would be a way. Um, how could we do that in our day? Education, help people with life skills. Is that possible? Well, our church has a program particularly for children and helping children in school to, help, to do better in school. So that would be one opportunity. Number two, a dedicated fund for the poor. Each member may set aside a dedicated amount or percentage from the family budget to regularly assist people in need, as well as to contribute to the welfare and development projects run by his or her church. The money in every believer's hand should be divided into three equal parts. I don't know whether these are supposed to be equal parts. This is pretty amazing. A, God first through tithes and offerings. So how much are we supposed to, what percentage are we supposed to give to God? Well, 10% for sure. At least. And B, the family, is that another 10%? And the destitute, is that another 10%? That's a pretty big chunk of our wages, isn't it? However, it is important to remember that one, and Ellen Wright quotes the passage which we have here below. Hold on. The tithe is set apart for a special use. It is not to be regarded as a poor fund. It is to be especially devoted to the support of those who are bearing God's message to the world and it should not be diverted for this purpose. So this is not to be, we're not supposed to say, oh, well, let, me, let me take my, my tithe and use it to help the poor. The tithe is specifically to support those who are preaching the gospel. It may be difficult for us to understand exactly how leaving extra corn or wheat in the field or not harvesting the corners of our property should be applied to us who are not in the farming business. How does that apply to us? Well, there was a contribution that the Israelites called the second tithe, or in Hebrew, Maser Sheni, of all the increase. And you can read about it in Deuteronomy 14. We'll look at a couple of those passages just now. Set aside for the family's religious expenses and for charity. Okay, how is this supposed to be done? Jim? Deuteronomy 14, verses 28 and 29. At the end of every third year, bring the tithe of all your crops and stores into your towns. As food is for the Levites, since they own no property, and for the foreigners, orphans, and widows who live in your towns. They are to, to come and get all they need. Do this, and the Lord your God will bless you in everything you do. Okay, so this was a local... Fun, presumably, in our day, would be set up in the church. Take care of poor people, right? Okay. Deuteronomy 26. Uh, verses 12 and 13. Every third year, give the tithe, the tenth of your crops, to the East Levites, the foreigners, and the orphans, and the widows, so that in every community they will have all they need to eat. When you have done this, says, say to the Lord, None of the sacred tithe is left in my house. I have given it to the Levites, the foreigners, the orphans, and the widows, as you commanded me to do. I have not disobeyed or forgotten any of your commands concerning the tithe. Also from the Bible study. Have God. you ever given, have you ever stopped, said God, this message? Yep. Think about it. Anyway, go ahead. Every devout Israelite had to spend in Jerusalem one-tenth of the increase of their land as a second tithe. 
Joachim Jeremias, the Jerusalem in the time of Jesus, an investigation into economic and social conditions during the New Testament period. That's a good book. Yeah. Um, and from Ellen White, the second tithe is equivalent to money they were for two years to bring to the place where the sanctuary w was established. And after presenting a thank offering to God and a specific portion of the, to the priest, the offerers were to use the remainder for a religious feast in which the Levite, the stranger, and the fatherless and the widow should participate. Thus provision was made for the thank offerings and feasts at the yearly festivals, and the people were drawn to the society of the priests and the Levites, and they might receive, excuse me, that they might receive instruction and encouragement in the service of God. Every third year, however, the second tithe was to be used at home in entertaining the Levite and the poor. As Moses said, they, that they may eat within thy gates and be filled that is from Deuteronomy 26, 12, that this, would be this, tithe would, excuse me, this tithe would provide a fund for the use of the char charity and hospitality from Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 530. Okay, so this isn't the original tithe, this is the second tithe. Right. Okay. There were many who urged them, excuse me, who urged with great enthusiasm that all men should have an equal share in the temporal blessings of God. But this was not the purpose of the Creator. A diversity of conditions is one of the means by which God designs to prove, to prove and develop character. Yet he, excuse me, yet he intends that those who have worldly possessions shall share, excuse me, shall regard themselves merely as stewards of his goods, as entrusted with the means to be employed for the benefit of the suffering and the needy. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 5. Okay, we're running out of time. We've talked about Job, we've talked about Zacchaeus, we've talked about the rich young ruler. What have we learned? What can we conclude? Is it true that the care for the poor is a divine covenant command? Is that what you think of when you think of pure religion before God? Remember James 127? So what is the relationship between taking care of the poor and true religion? We're going to leave that question with you as a conclusion to this lesson. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we have read some challenging ideas in this lesson. May we figure out the best way to implement them in our given situation, wherever it might be, wherever you, we are around the world. And Lord, may we promote the gospel, may we share it with others in a way uh, financially and loving our brethren, uh, even our enemies in a ways that will lead them to back to you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.